Good afternoon. Everybody hear me okay? Yep. All right. So it's me and Michael Hansen standing between you guys and Friday rush hour traffic. So I realize we're at the end of the show here, and I appreciate you guys being the survivors that waited till the end. I'm going to talk about health concourse. Um, health concourse is, is, is many things, but one thing that it is is it's a platform that aggregates data from a variety of sources and turns them into fire resources. Now this may be a, a theme or a line you've heard before. In fact, I was impressed to find out how many other groups uh, here today presented similar types of things. So I'm going to show you how we do that, but I'm really going to focus on the value add services we add on top of that because we believe there's a lot more you can do once you've done the hard work of getting data into fire. You can start to ask questions of that data you couldn't ask before. All right, so that's, that's the uh, intro for Health Concourse. The business problem is not too dissimilar from what uh, others have presented. Data is fragmented. Right? You know, t 10 or 15 years ago, data was in paper form, and we all went digital, and that's great, there's EHR systems, but now it's fragmented. And it, and it gets fragmented when a patient receives care in multiple care uh, locations. Uh, if you think about a, a military veteran uh, patient, you know, they receive care in the, in the uh, military, uh, on a ship, or in the battlefield, or back home. Then they transition into the VA. The VA has 150 different medical centers, each running their own local instance of the, of the VISTA legacy platform. Uh, veterans receive more than half their care outside the VA network. They use mobile devices and mobile apps. There's numerous opportunities for data to become fragmented, even though it's digital. Right? So what do we do about that? So the basic pattern of how we're trying to position Health Concourse as a solution to this kind of problem is, as you can see below, it's the mediator, pro the mediator pattern. Right? We recognize there are many systems of record, each having a portion of the data. The data is not standardized. It's not universally accessible in a common way. And there are many systems of engagement. The mobile app, the smart on fire apps, the clinical portals, the analytics dashboards that need that data but are challenged by the fact that it's so fragmented and diversified across this ecosystem. So we represent the systems of insight, that cloud-based middleware platform that knows where the data physically resides, knows how to go and get it, but most importantly knows what to do with it once it has it. Has the ability to aggregate it, has the ability to normalize and standardize it, has the ability to enrich and optimize it through analytics and clinical decision support and other sort of uh, rules-based processing on top of the data. And at the end of all this, it's about exposing that through a common standards-based predictable API that people know where to go to get the data, right? That's Health Concourse in a nutshell. So what is it that we actually do behind the scenes? So this is a very high-level, uh, we all have architecture diagrams, as I re realize that. This is one that we put together that shows you the basic sort of flow, right? The idea on the bottom, first, is that you have to get data from the systems of record. There's a number of adapters and listeners and things you want to do to get the data, and there's various things you want to do then to normalize and standardize that data. Our approach is not to solve that problem ourselves. We are a good systems integrator company. We have those expertise, but we are not the expert in every single field. So we've built an open platform. Our platform is an orchestration engine, effectively, that knows how to call a collection of services within a service-oriented architecture where each one of those services encapsulates a best-of-breed capability. That might be a tool that's open source. That might be a tool that we have from Perspecta Labs in our own, our own lab environment. That might be one of our partners' tools. It might be one of our customers' tools. The point is, it's, you know, we leverage what's out there. There's lots of digital assets available. We want to take advantage of the best of breed that's out there. So our approach was not to build a complete end-to-end -end solution, but to build a platform, a framework, that allows us to orchestrate a workflow that makes sense to systematically walk through the steps you need to improve the data, but to utilize the best of breed technologies that are out there. Some may, some may be our own, some may not, right? And so we encapsulate. We have this service wrapper pattern. Where we send variable data in. We do a bunch of stuff to it. I'm going to show you in more detail what that looks like. We get data back out as fire resources. That is our canonical standard. Right? Once you've achieved fire resources, you have a standard to work with. You now can ask questions of that data you could not ask before. It's been normalized and aggregated. It is now computable. So we start adding in the enrichment and knowledge services. This is where CDS hooks come into play. This is where you can start evaluating the data against clinical quality measures. This is where you can apply medical algorithms and, and calculators and logic. This is where you can apply statistics and analytics and machine learning and start learning things of the data. But what's, what's really important and what we think is really important is we're bringing that stuff to the data. It's no longer secondary use. Secondary use isn't good enough, right? You can't stop at the canonical model and put an API on it. That's not good enough because someone's going to take that data and go do something with it and you're not going to learn about that. You're not going to learn from that experience. You're not going to get those learnings and findings and knowledge back into your system. So really the value add is how do you take your fire-based data, use it to evaluate business logic, infer and extrapolate knowledge from it, and then make that knowledge closed loop, closed loop analytics. Get the data back into your data set so that when someone calls your APIs, 
not only getting the raw data that came from medical devices and you know, Cerner's and Epic's and EHR's and patient sources and all the things that a lot of us are working on, that's great, but you also get the inferred knowledge and the value that you get from the closed loop analytics, right? And the last piece of the architecture is managing it as an integrated data set. The tools in place to be able to store it, to query it, to overlay consent. We've seen very uh, good presentations all week that show these capabilities. We have them too, we have them as well. You know, and it gets exposed through uh, an API manager on the top. So sort of bottom to top, that's the core flow. And what we've done is we've gone out and said, what are the di different capabilities? What are the features across each of these layers that allows us to realize this architecture? And what is that architecture? What is the systematic flow that you want to go through from bottom to top. And we've realized there are seven different steps, seven key steps. And my caveat is this. This diagram has changed 117 times at least. It'll change 117 times more before I'm done. We're evolving and we're learning as a byproduct of our own experiences, right? And having an open-based platform where we can bring in best of breed allows us to continuously learn and change the architecture. So we're adding, always adding new boxes or splitting boxes or whatever makes sense based on new technologies and new discoveries and new architectural patterns. I'm not going to go through all the details, but basically it's integration services are the first thing you do. Go and get the data. Next step, normalize. Normalization comes in many steps. It means transforming data structures into fire. It means dealing with terminology differences so that we can recognize that myocardial infarction from one organization and heart attack from another organization are, in fact, isosemantic. They're the same thing. They should be encoded the same way. It also means identity resolution. Joe Smith from one organization is Joseph Smith in another if they have the right set of matching demographics or not, right? We need to be able to handle those, those things across a diverse uh, data ecosystem. Provider directories, organizational directories. We heard some great presentations from Sequoia and other groups that are doing things in this space that we would like to leverage. Natural language processing. Natural language processing is used in lots of places. We use it for normalization because we recognize that over 50, you know, up, to, up to maybe 80% of all clinical data comes into our system as a free text note. We can't do anything with that. That is not computable, right? You cannot run analytics against that. You cannot run clinical decision support against that. So we use NLP to normalize the data by evaluating those records, finding the key topics, extracting them, and creating fire resources from them, creating conditioned resources from the, the diagnoses and the problems and the symptoms that are you know, embedded inside a clinical note, as an example. That, that achieves the canonical model. Once we've done that, we can start doing interesting things. We can start enriching the data. We start analyzing it, we start applying metadata, we can put in provenance in there, we can put confidentiality scores in there about how, how, how truthful the data is to the source, we can map it to source records, we can do things like uh, fire conformance and data quality and, and validation checks to make sure there's a, a, enough data quality in place to be able to support the business operations you want to do. Right? So again, a collection of services we can use. And then the knowledge services. This is where you can bring clinical decision support. So we've been working with CDS hooks implementers who you know, built, they've done a knowledge mining. We're not knowledge engineers of perspective. That's not our expertise. But other companies are. And we don't want to compete with them. We want to leverage what they've done. Right? They're the best at it. So CDS Hooks allows us a mechanism by which we can evaluate our data as part of this pipeline in real time against a set of rules. Extract knowledge. Learn from the data. But most importantly, take those learnings, put them back into the data set so it's part of what you get when you call the APIs. Analytics, calculators, clinical quality measures, all those things fit in the knowledge layer. The second to last layer then, of course, is data management. You've got to be able to store it. That might mean putting it in a cache temporarily for, for, for rapid retrieval and indexing it. That might mean, mean putting it into a data lake or a data warehouse for longer term persistence or for the rich analytics that requires that sort of computing power. And the last layer is really then the API layer, right? exposing this through an API gateway. It's controlled, it's managed, it's measured, it's monitored, it's secured through OAuth and, and, and all the smart on fire uh, requirements of your APIs and doing that in a controlled manner. We also include things like context and process services in here. For us, what that means is the tools you need to be context aware. Right? It's not good enough anymore to have just a CRUD fire service out there that responds to things. It's better if your service knows the workflow, understands when a patient's been admitted into the hospital so it can go and load that patient's record and pre-curate the APIs and clinical decision support and analytics necessary to support that particular use case. Right? So we're working on those sort of context aware services that allow us to be, you know, to be responsive to the environment. And on the top of that, of course, are the systems of engagement that use this. This is a reference architecture. I've not described anything to you that, 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 that calls out a product. It's just a collection of features organized in a systematic way that we think is important to consider. Maybe not all of them in all, in all cases, but these are things you should consider when building a platform of this description. So the next slide, then, is basically our implementation of that architecture. Now, as I mentioned before, our approach is to use a platform-based approach where we can go out and we can find best of breed. 
And so as we've identified key features like natural language processing, we asked ourselves, you know, who does this stuff? We don't. Who does it? You know, is there open source stuff we can use? Are there, are there COTS products we can use? Are there partners we can, we can bring into the mix? And in this, that particular example, we decided to go with the CTAGS framework. It's open source. It's OK. It's not great. But you can enhance it. And we've enhanced it by going to the University of Utah and working with them, because their, exper their expertise are in this area. So we'll learn from them, leverage them. We've figured out a way to make that pretty powerful. Uh, terminology. We've, we went out and talked with Walters Kluwer and used a health language engine. We could have used Clinical Architect or others as well. I'm sure they're just as, just as good, but health language is really powerful, so we went and used it. Idea being that we go out and find out what makes the most sense, we encapsulate it into a service, we fit it within our, our orchestrated workflow. Uh, I got the five minute warning, so I'm going to skip ahead really quick. This is our coalition of partners, and this is always evolving and growing. Why I love to present at forums like this is it usually leads to, first, to future partner conversations. So if, if there's someone in the audience who has a piece of technology that might be important and relevant within this context, you'd like to work with us in a collaborative way, we're, we're all game. We're all for it. These are the, the, the dozen or so companies, several of which are in the room today. Mike, Michael from Microsoft's presenting next. I see Humetrics is in the room. There's, you know, DXC is in the room. There's several folks you know, that we're working with that are putting all these pieces together. OK. In the interest of time, I'm doing screenshots, not live demos. So I'm going to whiz through these because I've only got about four minutes left. This is a, a UI we built just simply to show you the outcomes. Right? The UI itself is not the product. The product is the platform in the cloud, but you have to have something tangible. Right? So what I'm showing you is that we have multiple records, in this case conditions, coming back. Uh, you can see that they're all terminology encoded. Uh, that's, because, that's because we have terminology services in place to allow us to do that. You can see that they have provenance information. You can tell they came from all scripts or Cerner or Synthetic Mass or Vista or whatever the case may be. Each one of these sources provides the data through a different mechanism and gives, it, gives the data in different format with different degrees of standardization. That's the heterogeneity and complexity that we're dealing with so we can give you a uniform response at the other end of the API. You can click on any one of these. And you can see the fire resource behind it. This is basically the fire structure that includes the data from that particular record. Um, on the bottom, you can see it's generalized anxiety disorder. That's the core sort of coding attribute within that condition resource. But on top of it, you'll see there's a bunch of tags. So we're adding a bunch of metadata to the record to make it more useful. Provenance information, for instance. Data quality information. Things called security labels, so we can segment our data and know what portion of our data has to do with mental health, so we can make sure that only the mental health provider has access to that and nobody else. You know, things like that. We're adding tags that allow us to make the data more intelligent and useful. This next view is a view of our natural language processing output. Taking a free text clinical note that happens to have a term called uh, you know, hypoglycemia and bar buried inside of it somewhere, using the algorithm to figure out what that term is, but most importantly, encoding it to the SNOMED code for hypoglycemia. It's now computable. It was not computable before. Now it's computable. You can run analytics and clinical decision support against that data, whereas before it was only human readable. Clinical knowledge services. Now you've done this data, how do you use this to infer knowledge? Here's an example of using clinical decision support through a CDS hooks. We're working with a company called Harmonix and Motive MI and others to do this kind of stuff. We take our data, we pass it over to them, they evaluate it against their rules that are all evidence-based and based on clinical research. They provide back information cards, suggestion cards, clinical alerts, et cetera, that enrich the value of the data, give us the inferred knowledge. The examples here are we pass in a lab result, they pass back the clinical interpretation. Or we put, pass in the fact that a foot exam occurred and they pa pass back what the abnormalities were. Things that weren't in the raw data sources, but you can learn from the data itself or bringing that to the data, making it available through the APIs. And the key thing that I've circled the little blue icon on the fire there is that even the findings are fire resources. I mean, that's what fire is so great. Fire can be used for the raw clinical data. It can also be used for the findings and the inferred knowledge. So things like measure report resources and guidance response resources are really useful for capturing those inferred learnings and making that part of the data set. Next view is uh, consent. So I mentioned the security labeling thing. We can segment our data by analyzing it and understand what portion of it's mental health, what portion has to do with sexual trauma, what portion has to do with uh, AIDS and, and sickle cell anemia or whatever, so that a patient then can go and say, Dr. Smith can see all my data, Dr. Jones can see you know, all my data except for mental health, and then nobody from Clinic 4 can see my data. Or whatever level of granularity, you can specify by organization, by time, by role, by purpose of use, all tagged against different categories, or what we call sense security labels, that are part of the metadata now on the record. And the last one I'll show you is a machine learning example. Working with uh, our partners, Microsoft, we took our data and, and applied supervised machine learning to do things like diabetes predi prediction across, a, across, a, uh, across the population. So we trained it to identify those folks who are low, medium, or high risk for diabetes and what their various demographic and clinical factors were related to that. Right, so here's a view of that. Again, things you can ask of the data you couldn't ask before because it's all been standardized, aggregated, and made computable. 
Last thing is I'll say thank you, but also um, our sandbox. Uh, there are several sandboxes out there. We're also going to be releasing a sandbox. The value of our sandbox will be, it'll be populated with um, hundreds of thousands of synthetic records. We do a lot with uh, Cynthia and, and the synthetic record tools. In fact, I'm the chair of the Ocera Synthetic Data Working Group. So if anybody wants high volume, high variety, high quality clinical synthetic data, come talk to me about that. We use it ourselves. We ingest it into our systems. And we have a, a nice population set you can work with. The APIs will be exposed, also have access to all the knowledge services, the CDS evaluations, et cetera, that come through the APIs. This uh, sandbox will be available probably in the next month or two, what we're predicting. And I think with that, I am out of time. So thank you.